This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. They're part of America's greatest generation, World War II veterans who served their country with honor and distinction. On the special edition of Conversations, we join them for one final mission. This special edition of Conversations is originating from Pensacola Aviation Center, a fixed-based operation at Pensacola International Airport. Over to my west is NAS Pensacola Sherman Field, home of the world-famous Blue Angels. Back to the northeast is Whiting Field, where Navy pilots go to train. And down Highway 98, about 60 miles, is one of the nation's most vital Air Force bases. Eglin Air Force Base. Given Northwest Florida's rich military history, Pensacola makes the perfect setting to honor some of America's World War II heroes. Veterans Flight, the final mission, is the brainchild of local lawyer and aviation enthusiast Roy Kinsey. Veterans Flight is a way to honor World War II aviators and other World War II veterans because a few people that flew with us were not aviators. It's a way to hopefully give a good example to young Americans of what America was like more than 70 years ago and let them know in some small way how much they owe to these gentlemen and some ladies for the great country they gave us. This is what, your second one? Well, this is the second formal veterans flight. Mm -hmm. We did it last year, Veterans Flight 2014. It was a great success. And very frankly, I thought it would be a one-time event because so many of these guys are aging out. Mm -hmm. My dad was a World War II Marine. He died one week before his 90th birthday in 2010, which for a guy who didn't think he'd live to see 25, he thought was a pretty good deal. Yeah. But we did it last year, everything went great. Hadn't planned to do it again, but I had a lot of people ask me, are you guys gonna fly in the air show again? Are you gonna do the veterans thing again? I said, well, no, it was a one-time deal. Everything went great, I'm not gonna push our luck. They said, oh, you've gotta do it. And then it hit me that this is the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. And the beach air show falls midway between the anniversary of the German surrender and the Japanese surrender. So I said, okay, maybe we do need to try to see if we can do this again. So I sent out an email, didn't send it to the veterans who'd flown with us last year because I didn't want anybody to be disappointed if we couldn't do it again. But I sent it to a lot of the guys in the Stearman community, sent it to a lot of people who had encouraged me to do it, and the response was just overwhelming. Last year, we had three airplanes on Friday and four on Saturday. This morning, we had 11. And we had one that was coming but had a mechanical problem and had to cancel. Now for those folks who don't know, explain to us and tell us about and tell us about the history of the Stearman. Well, the, the Stearman is named after legendary aircraft designer Lloyd Stearman. And Lloyd Stearman, back in the 30s, designed biplanes. He designed a prototype trainer for the military, which became what we commonly refer to as the Stearman. And then the Stearman company was bought by Boeing. So virtually all of the airplanes that you saw today are Boeing production. During World War II, Boeing built enough of the Stearmans to top 8,500. They built enough spare parts to build another 2,000 airplanes. And the Stearman was used as the primary trainer by both the Army Air Corps and the Navy. The Army Air Corps called theirs the PT-17 for okay. primary trainer 17. The Navy called theirs the N2S-12345, depending upon when it came along and which engine it had. Now, there are different colors out there, and what does that mean? Well, the Army Air Corps airplanes were painted primarily with blue fuselages and the yellow wings. Mm -hmm. The Navy airplanes were all yellow. Okay. Now, at certain points during the war, you had some that came out basically just in primer colors because they needed them. Right, right, yeah. right. 
Where, when did you first get interested in the Stearman airplane? Well, I've been in, I got interested in the Stearman airplane many, many years ago and spent probably 15 years off and on looking at them. Right. And I'd go fly one and talk to the guy about buying it and either price wasn't right or the airplane wasn't right. And then May of 2010, I had found the right airplane. A wonderful gentleman who was retired mechanic from Delta Airlines was finishing a restoration. I went up and looked at the airplane, and as a matter of fact, Jim Ratliff, who's one of the guys flying here today, told me about it. Went up and looked at it, turned to Alan Thompson, the gentleman who'd restored it, and I said, Alan, they're gonna throw me out of the lawyer's union for this, <laughs> but your price is fair. I'm not gonna try to bargain with you. Just tell me when the airplane will be ready. Because I knew the next person that saw that airplane would buy it. And, you know, so many of these, as, as we've talked to some of the veterans that uh, flew today, and some of them talked about, you know, the, the, the fact that the Stearmans, after they were used in, in the military, went on to become crop dusters and, and things of that nature. So, so the, the restoration's a pretty big deal. Well, the restoration is a very big deal, very labor-intensive. But the good thing about the airplanes being used as crop dusters is it prevented them from being scrapped. Mm. I mean, if you look back at some of the historical photographs and writings about the period right after World War II, you read about B-17s, B-24s, the big bombers, some of the fighters just being chopped up and melted down to make toasters. Right, right. Not the case, though, with the Stearman. No, with the Stearman, they recognized they had a, a role to play in crop dusting or aerial application. They sold the airplane surplus. Mine sold for $523.25. <laughs> I'm assuming that's not what you paid for it. <laughs> but a I paid, multiple of that, I, right? I, I, paid, <laughs> I paid slightly more than that for my airplane. As a matter of fact, I think you can buy one tire but not two for that in today's world. But they were used as aerial application airplanes. And of course, some of them had larger engines put on them. They, of course, your front cockpit was turned into a hopper tank. They put a hopper tank there to hold the spray. And then once they were worn out, and once modern, higher performance aerial application airplanes became common, they just got shoved in barns and back of hangars, that sort of things, until guys like Alan Thompson would buy them or buy the parts, and occasionally somebody will find a a whole warehouse full of parts uh -huh. but and they'll take them and they go through it strip it down to nothing you usually have to replace some of the tubing in the fuselage and the fuselage is built almost like a bridge it's tremendously strong replace that of course everything in today's world gets uh, primered with epoxy primer and they put a rust preventative inside the tubing and in many ways the workmanship in the restoration is better than the original manufacturer because in the 1940s they were trying to crank these out pretty quickly because the military needed them right. and a lot of the people who were actually working had never been in the aircraft industry before you know, if you look back at that point in time and you remember the the Rosie the Riveter right right it's one of the things that really got women into the workforce right. the men were over fighting and women were building these airplanes right. You know, the interesting thing about this airplane is, um, you know, most aircraft today are either metal or some of the newer things coming out, carbon fiber. Yeah. This, this airplane is fabric. And so for those <laughs> folks who don't understand or know a, a lot about aviation, explain that and, 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 the, and the concept behind that. Well, the concept was you want to cover the fuselage, you want to create some streamlining, and you want to reduce weight. So what they would do, and of course you mentioned the, the fabric, but the wings, for example, have wooden spars and wooden ribs. Mm -hmm. uh, the ailerons are a metal construction covered with fabric. Uh, the wooden wings are covered with fabric. There is some metal around the area immediately behind the engine. The baggage compartment door is metal. Yeah. <laughs> and when they first manufactured these, they used what was called grade A cotton. And you've got some very lightweight aluminum formers that actually give the shape to the fuselage and then the fabric covers it. Right. 
And if you ever watch someone working to put the fabric covering on the wing, you are really glad that they're skilled craftsmen who can do this, and you don't have to. <laughs> because the fabric is put on there, there's a almost like a glue that holds it, but then there's what's called rib stitching. And you actually run a twine, a special aeronautical twine, from the top of the wing down through the wing, penetrate the fabric, go around the, the rib, back up, and there's a special knot that you tighten and then it actually hides itself under the fabric and then you go up to the next one. And you watch the, the people who are really artisans do this and you say, can I try that? And they kind of look at you and smile and say, boy, are you stupid. <laughs> and they'll walk you through one or two and you just say, my God, my knees would never survive this because you're going up and down, up and down. And even if you have the jig to spin the wing, it's, it is unbelievably tiring. It really makes you appreciate what the men and women uh, of the World War II era went through and, and what they accomplished. It not only makes you appreciate it, it really makes you thankful for what they did. And you hate to bring politics into things, but politics are in everything in America. The question I have been most afraid to ask the guys, and I didn't ask it last year, I've been a little braver this year and asked them, I said, just how mad are you guys at today's Americans for screwing up the great country you gave us? Mm -hmm. And the answer is most of them are not very happy. Mm -hmm. As you visited with these gentlemen, and in some cases ladies, what has registered the most with you from talking to them? What, what did you take away from your conversations with them? God, you, you take so much away from them. Their, their humility, their appreciation for what we're doing with these flights. And I said, guys, this is our way of thanking you. Early on, a couple of people ask me, said, well, how much does it cost for them to do this? And I said, it doesn't cost anything. And they said, what do you mean? I said, they have to pay something. I said, no, they paid in full for these flights many years ago. Some of their contemporaries paid with their lives. The other thing that you take away from it is, guys like Paul McLean, his 99th birthday is tomorrow. <laughs> and he is so enthusiastic. They're, they're still living lives, they're active lives. They, they're very knowledgeable. You, these are not guys who are slipping mentally. Right. Their knees may not work as well as they did 60, 70 years ago, but their brains are full speed. Now we have some guys like John Beard, B-25 pilot, flew close air support for the British 8th Army in North Africa last year and this year, and you probably noticed we had some steps to help people get up on the airplanes. He said, John, you're gonna be in airplane over here. You turn around, look back, he's in the airplane. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, where are the steps? He didn't need any steps. Headed out there today. I don't need any steps, I think he's 95. It's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. amazing. These gentlemen and ladies are just so impressive. Okay. and. And, and like you say, we're just, you know, so it, it, it really, you know, the, the, the term the greatest generation has been, and they, they truly are. If anything, that's not an adequate expression. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they came back from the war, they didn't have their hands out, they weren't complaining about things, they went back to school, they went to work. A lot of these folks, especially the Army Air Corps guys, because of Eglin Air Force Base, stayed in the military. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have guys like Mel Bryant. You probably met him this morning. He was shot down on his 37th combat mission, captured by the Germans. Fortunately, it was toward the end of the war. Spent two months in captivity when I was talking to him to invite him. One of the things he made sure I understood was that even though being a prisoner of the Germans was probably not as bad as being a prisoner of the Japanese. It bore no resemblance to that old Hogan's Heroes TV show. <laughs> I bet not, I bet not. So he spends 33 years in the Air Force. I think his last tour, he was a commanding officer down at Hurlburt. Gets out, you know, retires as an 06 bird colonel. All right. What do you do at that stage of life? 
do you retire? Do you go fish? Do you ride around? No. He goes to work for the clerk of court. He spends another 30 plus years as a deputy clerk for the clerk of court's office in Okaloosa County. Just an amazing generation of people. No question about it. Yeah. I think it's a great thing you've done, and, and, and I know you don't like to take a lot of credit for it, but you deserve a lot of credit for it. I know, I, I know behind the scenes you've put an awful lot of hard work in. I, I, I want to switch back just for, for folks out there who love airplanes and love flying and talk about the Stearman is a difficult airplane to fly. I mean, you have to have some real skill to fly that airplane, <laughs> correct? Well, you have to have some... It takes practice and a little bit of luck, especially in landing. <laughs> yeah. it, it can be a very challenging airplane to land. It's a very forgiving airplane in the air. It, now, it was designed to teach young pilots the skills they needed to fly bombers and fighters as they progressed in their military training. It's a difficult airplane to fly precisely. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who are airplane nuts, I often tell them there's never been a better airplane design to demonstrate the concept of adverse aileron yaw. For most people, it means nothing. For aviators, they understand exactly what I'm talking about. That's right. That's right. And how many years have you been flying? Uh, tail drag. I, I'll ask you tail dragger because the Stearman is a tail dragger, and and and, and as those of the aviation like to yep. say, you know, if you're really flying, you're flying, flying a tail, tail dragger. dragger. So, uh, how many years you've been flying tail draggers? Well, since 1965. Wow, okay. So, so. It's, it's pushing 50 years. <laughs> That's it. Well, Roy, what a great thing you've done. And I know I've had an opportunity to visit with many of the veterans, and, and I know they're greatly appreciative. And I know you put a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat into it. So congratulations. Well, I think we have more fun than they do. You yeah. know, everybody that brought their airplane here is a volunteer. They came on their own nickel. We're not being paid like the air show performers. Mm -hmm. But people who own Stearmans understand that even though we're the registered owners of the airplanes, in reality, we're custodians of pieces of history. And we have an obligation to do things like this and to, to share the heritage of the airplane with other Americans. One thing that's unique and special about the Stearman is that it's the last biplane that was used in, in, in significant numbers by the military. It's the last open cockpit plane that was used in significant numbers by our military. And it was used to train more pilots for World War II than any other trainer. Uh, there were about 10,500 of these built. And uh, other two trainers that were used that were significant, one only about 1,500 were built, and the other only about 6,000. So it's a delightful plane to fly. You know you're the caretaker of a piece of history and you can kind of see things through the eyes of the young men that trained in these airplanes to go and fight World War II in the air. I really enjoyed it. It felt like uh, the first day I'd ever been in a plane here in Pensacola. Now, you told me you actually soloed in the Stearman when I you did. started your Navy training. Tell me that story. I did. Well, I came down here in February of 42. Uh, I had already soloed out in John Rogers Airport, uh, paid for lessons and so forth. But as far as the Navy was concerned, this was the first plane that I soloed in. What was that like? Oh, it was great. It was just exactly what I was, what I wanted to do for years, you know. And uh, I couldn't imagine that I had gotten so lucky as to be down here flying airplanes. What's it like flying a Stearman? <clears throat> well, it's uh, it's hard to describe because uh, it's like flying an airplane. You pull back on the stick and it goes up and. Uh, down it goes down but it's uh it's a lot of fun it's a good stable airplane it's fairly easy to fly and uh it's uh, unless you do something really bad it's kind of hard to hurt yourself in it now when you went up yesterday did let you take the stick any no 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 i imagine the guy that owns the plane you know i i can't imagine that he wants to have a guy my age and and it's been so long since i've flown that uh, he wants me flying his airplane very much. How old are you? I'm 95. Earl Stockton and Joe Edmondson with us. Mr. Stockton, you just went for a flight in the Stearman. How was it? Very fine. I've been in them. I used to fly the Stearman quite a bit. Is that right? Years ago. I went through it in primary, of course, and then I worked as a crop sprayer for two years, and we used the Stearman. Right, right, right. And we would work in Quincy, Florida in the early spring, 
spraying shade tobacco. Then that was done, we would go up to Hartford. We had no radio, we had nothing, but we had a good airplane, that old <laughs> still one. Now, Joe, tell me about, it was your airplane. You, yeah. you, you flew Earl here today. Uh, how did you get involved with this? Well, I actually bought it after I retired from the airline, or I was actually still flying. Okay. And I went to look at one and I just fell in love with the airplane. And I really don't own the airplane. It's, it's, I'm just a caretaker. I took care of it after these guys gave it up. They used it for flight training, and they used it for crop dusting. And I'm just a caretaker until one day I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. I hope they pass me a little money when I do it. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like flying this gentleman today? It was an honor. I mean, you can't express what it feels like to, to fly these guys, to talk to them. And we wouldn't be sitting here today if it weren't for his generation. I thought it was kind of interesting you were out here after you flew, you had him sign off on your logbook. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He signed it and I flew uh, Miss Jenny. Uh, she flew yeah. this morning. She yeah. was one of the women air wasp. Women yeah, air. Wasp. Yeah. Anyway, they, they flew. She actually flew the Stearman in World War II delivering it. Oh, yeah. They flew bombers. They flew P-51s. Yeah. They flew all the big airplanes. Yeah. And I had her sign my logbook. Pretty neat to have that. It is. Uh, that's the kind of signatures yeah. in your it logbook. Is. Very neat. Well, thank you so very much, my friend, for your thank service. You. Joe, thank you for participating. My pleasure. Best of luck to you. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. While all agreed the veterans' flight was fun, the memories of the true mission are still fresh, some seven decades later. It takes me back 70 years when I started out, and uh, what, a, what a wonderful thrill it is to get back in an old trainer and go out and have fun. Flying today is so fast and so high, it's no fun, it's all work, it's all computerized. But those are the days when you had the fun. What did you enjoy the most today about your ride? Oh, the day, really. And this group of uh, people who bring their airplanes in and their time to give old guys like me a, a thrill to get back in the air. And it's, the day is so beautiful, and it's just made for flying. So uh, all the guys are going to have a, a, a wonderful things to say about today. At this point in my history, I just take it a day at a time, too. Uh, I don't plan ahead too much. But when this came up and the opportunity to take a ride in, in one of the old airplanes, uh, I'm so blessed. And uh, it's such a wonderful hobby. And these folks, that's all they know is flying tail draggers. And uh, it's such a difficult airplane to fly because if you're in a 40 mile an hour wind, that thing will fly like a kite. And it's tough to get it back on the ground. And when it's on the ground, if you got your, your subject to your crosswinds and one thing or another, it's a tricky airplane. It's a handful, and, isn't it? Oh, but it's such a wonderful thrill for guys like me after 60 years of flying prop airplanes to get back into the, the fun type of airplane and flying. And these guys do just such a wonderful job. But it was all fun. I wish I could do it again. We were escorted into Pearl Harbor on the 18th day of December. And it was a sight that uh, I'll never forget. Uh, battleship laying on its side here as you went in. And then the Arizona and the battleship row was Ford Island behind that where all the seaplanes and the other planes were. They were just, just one big mess. Tell me about the people. Tell me about the people at Pearl Harbor. What was the feeling like? Well, there was a lot of shock. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, uh, but I think uh, the attack really brought, brought people together. Uh, they didn't like what happened, and uh, everybody just joined ranks. And uh, uh, the, of all those the capital ships, those battleships that were damaged, uh, five of those were repaired and back in service before the war was over. Uh, the USS uh, California happened to be in Tokyo Harbor with the Missouri when they signed the treaty. 
So that was really a big boost for, for the Navy. We were all set to go aboard the Lexington, and they dropped that in bomb. And all of a sudden, it was all over. And they, Admiral Nimitz put out, put out an order. He said, we're having a ceasefire with the Japanese, but if attacked, shoot them down in a friendly fashion. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you, Mr. Pace? Well, I could lie and say I was 39, <laughs> but I won't do that. I'll hit 96 in August. 96, I'm 95 now. 96 years old. 96 years climbed old. Climbed into an open cockpit airplane today and flew around Pensacola Beach. <laughs> <laughs> What's the secret? Well, I don't know. I guess I could say clean living, but I'd be lying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I guess the Lord's been good to me, and I have, I have I enjoyed myself and hope I still can in a while. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure is all mine. God bless Thank you. Thank you for the honor. Thank you for your service. Veterans Flight 2015 was a day to celebrate American exceptionalism. From the World War II veterans who fought for our freedom, to the volunteer pilots who donated their time, money, and airplanes to salute the men and women who they so respect. But ultimately, it served as a reminder that we should never take our freedom for granted. Thank you for watching this special edition of Conversations. You can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations, also on YouTube and Facebook. I hope you enjoy the broadcast. I'm Jeff Weeks. Take great care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.